Walt Disney presents... The Wonderful World of Color. And now your host, Walt Disney. Of all of the mysteries of nature, the one that has puzzled man the most is the flight of birds. Watching them, man has always had a secret wish that he too could fly. Nearly all of us have had this dream at some time in our lives, and when we see the birds performing their graceful maneuvers, we can't help but experience the wish all over again. The large soaring birds are the complete masters of the air, birds like the eagle. He uses the air currents so skillfully, we wonder how he can stay aloft, seemingly without effort. The familiar seagull is another who is perfectly at home with the air currents. Sometimes he looks as though he could go on like this forever. of the larger birds sail through the air with ease, making us wish we could do the same. Even the hummingbird is a flying machine of a sort. We might call him nature's helicopter. Now man, it turns out, came close to realizing his ancient dream when he invented the glider or sailplane. In a sailplane, you pitch your skills and your reflexes against the air currents just as the birds do. It's about as near to flying like a bird as it's possible to come. Our story on this show is about a boy who got wrapped up in sailplanes and almost wrapped one around a mountain. It's called The Boy Who Flew With Condors. And it begins, as might be expected, with a boy and a condor. The adventure began on a hot summer day in the California foothills. As was his habit at this time of year, the boy climbed higher and higher till he came to his favorite vantage point. His hobby was studying the California condors.
was fascinated by their amazing power of flight. But the boy was a dreamer who, like most of us, wished that he too might soar on magic wings above the earth. He spent many an hour like this, watching, envying, marveling at their effortless grace. When at rest, the condors were grotesque creatures, prehistoric looking, awkward, objects of ugliness. But when they took to the air, a transformation seemed to take place. They became masters of their element with a majestic beauty all their own. Suddenly, another kind of soaring bird came into view. Silent, swift, without any propulsion except the air currents. It rode the winds like the great condors themselves. This was a sailplane, or glider, a kind of man-made bird, but as graceful an object as the boy had ever seen. must have a closer look. Hello. Is everything all right? Oh, hi. Hey, would you be my witness to verify that I landed here? I just completed my overseas distance. And I'm gonna need a witness to kind of make sure that I did it. What is this for? I gained this badge. And it's called a Silver Sea Distance. And I think it's about... Mm, 31 miles. I think I overshot it by about 10. By the way, I'm Margaret Brewster. Oh, I'm Chris Curie. And so it was that a boy named Christopher Jury met an interesting girl named Margaret and first heard of something called the Silver Sea. Hey, oh, here they are, my ground crew. Ground crew, Silver Sea. The language of sailplaning was new to the boy and strange. But though he couldn't know it now, before long it would all become familiar and exciting, as exciting as it seemed to be to Margaret and her friends. Chris watched the next move with a consuming curiosity. Now that was how you got one home. You took it apart and carried it back to its starting point. Chris decided after so brave and thrilling a journey. For seeing the plane and the vast sky had done something to the boy. Here he realized was a dream. Here was soaring to match the great condors. The girl had said to come and try it sometime. And the more he thought about it, the more he thought he just might. Chris attended his first soaring meet as Margaret's guest. Torrey Pines, one of the finest sailplane spots of the California coast. For Chris, it was all something of an eye-opener, a whole new world of excitement. Sailplaning, Margaret explained, was the coming thing, the sport of the moment, attracting enthusiasts by the thousands. 
from Torrey Pines to Texas, from Texas to New York and back, all across the nation, it was becoming the fun thing to do. At the age of 14, Margaret was the youngest flyer in the meet. But the reflexes of youth are instinctive and much at home in a sailplane. And now she put on a show none of the other pilots had even attempted. Watching from the sidelines, Chris began to feel envious. If a mere girl could do this, why couldn't he? Suddenly, to no fault of her own, Margaret was in trouble. It can happen to the best of pilots, the updrafts give out. And now Margaret's little plane began to sink out of sight below the cliffs. Fortunately, the beach itself was an ideal landing strip. In fact, the spot all pilots headed for in an emergency. And Margaret handled her little plane with a veteran's cool skill. In a matter of moments, rescue was on the way in the form of a noisy little power plane. At least all engine powered planes seem noisy to the true sailplaner. in a situation like this, the purist can't be too choosy. Even under the best of conditions, a tow line take off can be tricky. And this one had some extra complications, a slanting beach, a stiff crosswind, and a water hazard. Sure, Margaret was determined to see this through. It was embarrassing to skid into the drink. It made you look bad in front of the other pilots, especially for a girl. This time, she really buckled down to business. On her next pass, she found the air currents that gave her altitude again. No more shenanigans. Now for the competition. A spot landing contest designed to test a plane's handling and the pilot's true skill. This time, no miscues. Touchdown on target. Chris decided for a slip of a girl 14. It was about then that he concluded there really was something to this sail planning. By the next day, Chris was ready to take up Margaret's invitation to come try it. But when he arrived at her soaring school, he was hardly prepared for the numbers and variety of sailplanes to be seen, craft of every sort, from trim single-seaters to workaday two-place trainers. Chris. Oh. 
Fred. This is Chris Jury. Chris, this is Fred. Fred Jury. Hi, Chris. See, I got my silver C. Oh, that's great. It was his field that I landed in. I used him as my witness. He didn't take a ride. Well, Chris told himself this is what he had come for, to try it. If Margaret can do it, he had said, I guess I can. But by the time the shoulder straps were fastened, and the seat belt secured, and the cockpit closed, he began to have some slight misgivings. He wondered if he'd been a little hasty. speed, Chris was at first scared, then tremendously excited, then strangely reassured by Fred Harris's calm manner and matter-of-fact voice. How do you like this? This is really something. I've never done anything like this before. All we're doing at the moment is uh, just towing to altitude. What is the normal release? Uh, 2,000 feet above the ground. We have no means of actually launching ourselves from the ground. Once in the air, we find uprising currents of air. Then we have the opportunity to a more sustained flight. Okay. Now, if you want to pull that little red knob ahead of you, on the dash there, we'll be free from the tow plane. you stay up in a sailplane? This depends on the lift conditions. Uh, actually, we're descending all the time in relation to the air immediately surrounding the sailplane. But when we enter an air mass that's going up faster than we're going down, then we have the opportunity to go up with it. This is what we seek in soaring. We try to find these areas of lift that are going up, and we're able to stay up for hours at a time. Do they fly distances in a sailplane? Oh, yes. Um, over 600 miles is the record at the present time. It was made back in Texas. Uh, a fellow flew from uh, Odessa, Texas, up into Nebraska. 600 and some miles just by finding lift? Well, he was using a storm frontal system, um, which creates an overriding air mass. And he just went on a straight line up a storm front. How high do they get? Well, quite high. The world's record was made right here, uh, 46,247 feet. Uh, this was done by Paul Bickle. As Fred Harris went on about altitude records and distance flights and the theory of soaring, Chris found the mystery of sailplaning no longer a puzzle. For the first time, he understood how the great condors could remain airborne for hours on end. And now he himself was caught up in that same world of wonder, stirred by its challenges, excited by its promise, and willing to fly on like this forever. But easygoing Fred Harris said no. There always came that time when you must drop back to Earth and reality. Oh, 
It was on the boy's next flight that he cast his lot with the condors, yielding himself completely to the lure and the thrill of soaring. How would you like to try your hand at flying this? Yeah, I sure would. Okay, just take hold of the stick lightly with your right hand, feet on the rudder pedals. Now, to make the sailplane go in the direction that we want it to go, always apply pressure on the controls in the direction we want the sailplane to go. This was the moment when Chris felt no longer earthbound. The wings of the plane seemed actually his own. Here was true adventure and challenge. And so began a logbook labeled Christopher Jury, a record of flying time, lessons learned, tests taken and passed. And then the big day every pilot hopes for, the first solo flight. Well, would you like to try it yourself? Yeah, I sure would. Okay, you're ready, huh? Yeah. Well, just remember now to stay relaxed and uh, keep your eye on that reference on the tow plane. And if you do get into any problems you feel you can't handle, uh, pull a release, come on back to the field. You're always within gliding distance. And uh, don't get carried away with soaring. Now we want you back here to the field. And good luck. Have a real good flight. Thanks a lot. came the moment of testing. How well would he do on his own in the vast air ocean? But now he was alone, relying only on his reflexes, his judgment, and his skills. This was what it meant to fly like a bird. It was a heady experience, one in which exuberance might easily overbalance caution. But he remembered Fred Harris's send-off. Don't get carried away with soaring. Now we want you back here to the field. You're always within gliding distance. Coming down, he discovered, was almost harder than going up. There were so many things to think of in that concrete runway rushing up to meet you. Perhaps it was the tension. Maybe he tried too hard. Whatever the reason, it wasn't the cleanest landing ever made. As the saying is, any landing's a good landing if you can walk away from it. And at least Chris could do that. Wow, real good. Real good. Good pop. Oh, Chris. 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 Real fun. Good Thank show. You, Chris. Real good to have you back on the ground again. Great. Oh, good landing. Good. Thank you, Bob. Chris? Hold it. Real good. Oh! <laughs> now Chris was a sailplaner. And to prove it, he had had the traditional baptism that follows a first solo.
Later that afternoon, while waiting his turn to go up, Chris saw what a sailplane can really do in the hands of an expert. Someday he'd perform aerobatics like that. But first things first. The problem of the moment was the Silver Sea test. Cross country, 32 miles, five hours aloft, and altitude gained, 3,280 feet. Wildlife observed en route, an unexpected dividend, but no extra points. Nature lover or sailplaner. For a moment, Chris seemed to forget which. And in the air, even an instant of forgetfulness can mean trouble. Now he'd lost his lift. Now it was lookout below. repeat an old saying, any landing is a good one if you can swim away from it. As it turned out, the damage to the plane was rather slight. Especially when compared to the damage to Chris's ego and the severe dent in his pride. Fred Harris let the boy stew a bit, just a wee bit for his own good. Then generously he turned on the famous Harris grin. After all, he knew as well as anyone that it's a rule of the game when you've got to come down, you've simply got to come down. Duck pond or no duck pond. Eventually, the record said Silver Sea. It didn't seem necessary to mention the ducks. Next try, in a new high-performance model, the gold badge. One hundred and eighty-seven miles of non-stop flight and a climb of almost 10,000 feet. And to prove the point beyond doubt, a recording instrument called a barograph to register every change in altitude. For every sailplaner, there are days when he can't seem to make the elements play his way. And for Chris, this seemed to be one of them. Research Center, would you like to go? Oh, man, would I? Hey, that's really neat. Thought maybe we could show you another type of gliding that you uh, might be interested in. The art of sail planning suddenly took on a whole new meaning for Chris when he and Margaret visited Edwards Air Force Base. For here at NASA, 
in a realm of space thinking and imaginative ingenuity, men had found ways to put the science of gliding to new and surprising uses. Test pilot Thompson told them a bit of what was going on. This is one of our X-15 research aircraft. It's uh, rocket powered and we've flown in excess of 4,000 miles an hour and 350,000 feet in altitude. We call it a hypersonic glider. That's the F-104 jet aircraft, Lockheed Starfighter. We use them as proficiency trainers for the X-15 pilots. To the fascinated visitors, nothing seemed less likely to fly than this odd contraption. Yet rocket motors, it turned out, could actually lift it and keep it aloft. This weird-looking craft is a lunar research vehicle designed to study problems involved in landing on the moon. Someday, said test pilot Thompson, a machine of this type might well deposit commuters safely at the moon's front door. The oddest glider of the lot, if glider it could be called at all, proved to be this stubby little craft, officially the M2, but more affectionately called the hot brick and the upside down flat iron. This was more like the sailplanes at home. The M2 is towed into the air like any sailplane and then cut loose on its own. experimental stage, this they learned is how future astronauts may eventually make their return to Earth, by gliding down through the atmosphere to almost any predetermined landing point. As Chris had begun to realize, there is more to the art of gliding that first meets the eye. By now, Chris had been bitten by the bug, the secret longing that sooner or later comes to every sailplaner. Now he wanted to try for the highest award in soaring, the Diamond Sea. It would be a challenge, a tough one, but he felt he was ready. And so did his best router, Margaret. And equally as important, so did Fred Harris over here and try to pick up this shear north. But I'm afraid the mountains get so high up in here that it's going to be overdeveloped. There's a cloud that'll be right on top of the peaks. And if that's the case, then uh, you should have altitude enough to cross over this valley and pick up this next ridge going north, east of it. And uh, uh, about that time you get up in here, it, it's going to be uh, dark. And, uh, but you'll have your diamond. This time, the problem was the biggest Chris had ever tackled. Before the flight was over, he must record 16,000 feet of altitude, and it must be a sustained journey of 311 miles, long enough for a pilot to get thirsty and even a bit hungry. It helped to know that Fred Harris had confidence in him. And of course, he knew he had Margaret pulling for him too.
ground control, this is 88 Zulu. Releasing at 5500, are you with me? Okay, fine and dandy, we'll be right behind you. We have you in sight. When a sail planner goes across country, it's helpful to have the ground crew go with him. And now Fred and Margaret set out to do just that. They took the trailer to bring the plane home at the end of the journey. But more than that, they wanted to stay in touch just in case of trouble. Destination for both parties, somewhere near Bishop. Rendezvous in case contact was lost, Bishop Airport. Zulu, uh, this is ground control. I'd move over against those uh, hills a little bit more there. You might get a little uh, push up there from ridge lift. Might try it anyway. Chris appreciated Fred's advice and immediately undertook to follow it. It was good to have an experienced observer along. The first hour, everything went smoothly, exactly according to plan. Ground control, this is 880. The lift's pretty good up here. I can keep going, I guess. I'm right on course. 88 Zulu, over. Though Chris was on course, as he had said, it wasn't long before the ground crew was not. That was the beauty of travel in the sky. No detours. But the earthbound travelers weren't so lucky. Now they'd have to double their speed and try to catch up, if they could, on these bumpy back roads. still smooth sailing. But for Fred and Margaret in the ground below, the journey had become a kind of obstacle course. This wouldn't do. Much more of this and they'd never catch up. 88 Zulu, meanwhile, was doing fine. No roadblocks up here. The altimeter said what it was supposed to say, and Chris felt he could even relax a bit. met the mountains Fred Harris had predicted. And fortunately, the clouds were not right on top of the peaks, at least not yet. No more relaxing now. From here on, he must tend strictly to business. Careful flying, alert attention, and supreme caution. This rugged terrain would prove whether or not he was a pilot, for this was the eastern face of the mighty Sierras. This was where the hot desert air rose thousands of feet to form what airmen call the Sierra Wave. It was country to take a sailplaner far, if he was game for the risk. But risk was what a Diamond Sea demanded. turbulence had begun to buffet the tiny plane. And Chris had his hands full, just trying to keep it under control.
visibility zero, his bearings lost, Chris tried circling, seeking a way out. Zulu, this is ground control. Can you hear us? Can you read us? No answer, except the crackling of heavy static. No answer to Chris's dilemma either, except hope. And suddenly hope itself seemed lost. situation deadly. Then, wonder of wonders, Chris saw a familiar form. It was his old friend, the Condor, leading him to safer air and clearer skies. He knew that if he would stick with these masters, his battle would be won. came for the moment a condor himself. Once in the clear, Chris could recognize his surroundings. Below, unmistakably, lay Mono Lake, and the sight of it cheered him, for he knew now that he'd traveled a legitimate diamond sea distance. Of course, there was still the problem of getting down safely, but he felt sure he could handle that. good to get his feet in the ground again. He knew where he was, and yet he didn't. From the surroundings, it could have been some other planet, one seemingly devoid of life. And that was his problem now. To verify his Diamond Sea achievement, he had to find a witness. Someone to say he'd actually landed here. A building. That suggested habitation of some sort. For every abandoned mine, there's usually an abandoned prospector to go with it. And this one had its old hermit, who was willing to sign an official-looking paper. Now the Diamond Sea was his. And now there remained one last little problem, how to get in touch with his friends. Chris was safe all right, and he knew he was safe. But they didn't, and they would worry. The conquering hero returns, but what a letdown in his moment of triumph to come home like this. Actually, it had never been Chris's intention to come home like this. He remembered all the times Fred Harris had had to come and bail him out, out of duck ponds and golf courses. And now he was determined to get back under his own power. guarantee anything. 
But if this ancient jalopy could get up to even 48 miles an hour, it just might put Chris back in the sky. Bishop Airport, meanwhile, Fred and Margaret kept the appointed rendezvous. They had almost given up hope, when out of the dusk, like a whispering wind, a shadowy sailplane floated gently to Earth. It was Chris, at last, home in triumph to receive their warmest congratulations. The Diamond Sea, Soaring's finest, an emblem of pride and shared achievement. It belongs to those who dare and those who venture, to the young in heart and the bold of spirit, to those like Chris and Margaret, who carry man's dreams aloft and free his aspirations in the high, wide sky. That's how a boy won the highest award in soaring, but not without some help from those real masters of the sky.